Good morning and welcome to the First Congregational Church of Essex. We are so happy that you are here to worship with us this morning. I wanted to uh, begin with a few announcements. Um, in the bulletin it says that tomorrow is the Gateway Luncheon and it's not too late to help. Uh, so you can sign up in the vestibule or talk to Joan Hill or Delcy McGrath. <clears throat> we also have the Shoreline Ringers on May 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, they'll be offering a concert right here in the church. Uh, they ask you to save the date for August 19th at 6 p.m. Um, for another concert at the Essex Town Park. Uh, this concert apparently replaces the former big band concert. And last, um, they are still gathering food for the backpack program. Uh, monetary donations are also welcome. Are there other announcements this morning? Yes, Joan Hill requests volunteers right after the church service today so we can set up some, ta some tables and chairs downstairs. Um, also, if you'd like to help tomorrow, you know, please come and help with the Gateway Luncheon. Uh, part of the Gateway Luncheon is we have the kids downstairs who are between three and four years old. My God, they're full of energy. It's amazing to watch them. And they're gonna be put on a little skit and singing for us. And part of their singing is way off tune. <laughs> but it sure is great to hear them. Go ahead. Glory be to God in the highest. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace that we have in you. We gather here this morning because you promised us that wherever two are gathered in your name, there you will be also. Let us pray. Dear God, we have gathered to praise and worship you. Come down, O Lord, and make your presence felt by all of us. Let your presence be known in our midst. Come with the abundance of your blessings and call us forward on this holy day. Amen. Please join me now in our opening hymn, which is number 547, Amazing Grace. <clears throat> Oh, 
We are now at the point in the service when we are able to lift one another up in prayer. So I wanted to ask if there were any specific joys or concerns among us this morning that need to be raised. Um, I know it says my former son-in-law is suffering from brain cancer. First of all, it's not brain cancer. He had two surgeries on his brain. Found no cancer, but it got all tangled up. So the reality of it is, is that he is not doing well at all. And they don't know what they're going to do at this point, whether they're going to try a third surgery or what. But he's in a hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they might have to fly him back up to Denver. And he just, he, he can't feed himself. He has a feeding tube. He had a tracheostomy. I don't know if that's the same thing as the feeding tube or what, but he yeah, does like that. that. And uh, he's just, he's, he's really like a vegetable at this point. <laughs> so we need his prayers. We need prayers for him and, and for his family. My, my daughter and her daughter, who is my granddaughter. So thank you. What is his name? Uh, Kurt Troutman. Kurt, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? That's for Bill Hawk. Sorry? Bill Hawk. She's being grabbed, uh, had two falls, and she broke her right hand uh, in the open night, and she was found underneath the sink that's padded, uh, and just bumping her head against her. She has terrific dementia, she's not doing well. The request was to pray for Josephine, who's had three falls and broken a wrist, and she is um, not doing particularly well at this time. So that request was, please keep Josephine in your prayers. Anyone else? Then let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, we thank you and we call on your name. We rely on you, our God, and our strength. Your continual steady presence in our lives is a gift. Your wondrous works continue to inspire both trust and awe in your faithful. But Lord, we know that each one of us has sometimes been less than perfect on this earth. We have not always been exactly who we seek to be in Christ. We struggle, Lord, to love this world and to hear your word. We fight to think first of you and later of ourselves. Please, Lord, forgive us, redeem us, preside in us, teach us, abide with us now in this space and sit by our side as we seek to draw nearer to you. Lord, as we seek closeness to one another, we bring you prayers of joy. This week, we are especially joyful for the rain, which we all know we so desperately need. And Lord, as we draw near to your kingdom, we also bring you prayers of need. We ask you to comfort those who need your reassurance. We ask you to hold all of your children in your loving embrace and deliver them the strength that they seek. This week, we especially pray for Kurt and for Bill and for Josephine, as well as all three of their families. God, our refuge and hope, when we are divided as communities, when despondency and despair haunt and afflict us, comfort and convict us with the stillness of your presence. Most holy and eternal God, you dwell in the heights of heaven, yet you chose to walk among us. Hold us carefully, we pray, and cultivate in us the knowledge that we may be healed by the unending love of Christ. Beckoning God, move in our lives, inviting us to journey to unknown territory, to listen for your voice, to speak your word, to live in constant relationship and conversation with you. Empowered by your spirit, grant us the courage we need to journey and trust and listen and speak and accept your commission to be your faithful people. Hear our prayers, God of power, and through the ministry of your church, help us to seek you as the fullness of life and work towards the vision of your kingdom right here on earth. Grant us strength and hope and love and patience and kindness so that we might walk in your footsteps each day. We ask all of this, Lord, in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in our responsive reading, which can be found on page number 528 of the Red Hymnal. <clears throat> we are going to be reading Psalm 88. Sorry, yeah, Psalm, yes, 88, okay. Incline thy ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save thy servant who trusts in thee. Thou art my God, be gracious to me, O Lord, for to thee do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of my servant, to thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, O Lord, art good and forgiving, 
abounding in steadfast love to all who call on thee. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Hearken to my cry of supplication. The day of my trouble I will call on thee, for thou dost answer me. There is none like thee among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like thine. All the nations thou hast made shall come and bow down before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and dost wondrous things. Thou alone art God. Teach me thy way, O Lord, that I may walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I give thanks to thee, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify thy name Thou, O Lord, art a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and take pity on me. Give thy strength to thy servant and save the son of thy handmaid. Show me a sign of thy favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame. Because thou, Lord, hast helped me and comforted me. And now I would like to invite up Marilyn Cohn, who will be doing our scripture readings for this morning. <clears throat> o oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout, violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in and I cannot, for I hear many whispering, Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my prosecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O oh, Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. That was Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 13. Now this is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. 
So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear for them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. So this section of Matthew that we've just read <clears throat> continues on a theme in Matthew of disciples who are imitating their masters. And I will admit that when I first read this reading in preparation for my sermon, I was not immediately drawn to it, and I had to wrestle with it a little bit before writing the sermon. This week's readings draw a parallel, appearing not just in what the disciples will say and do, but in what they will experience actually in the mission field itself. And we are told they will experience rejection, suffering, and for some, even death. This passage introduces a second stage of the mission instructions for the 12 disciples, which began earlier in Matthew. Directives for their evangelistic task take on a darker tone and resemble a warning as much as it resembles encouragement. If the first part of the instructions focused on practical aspects of the mission journey, the second part is taken up with the severe conditions that the apostles themselves will experience, though it is obviously coupled for, uh, with reasons for hope. Our passage for today focuses on the commitment of the apostles themselves while revisiting some of those earlier themes. During a former time, perhaps, such images of a master and his apprentice conveyed the relationship by which trades and various um, excellences in craft were passed down. A learner was inducted into a way of life by mimicking the mode of his master's way of life until he too had mastered the craft and then he too could take in his own apprentices. But in an automated self-help world that we currently find ourselves in, that master-apprentice model seems sort of quaint and antiquated. When I have a leaky faucet in my house, for instance, I turn to YouTube to do-it-yourself videos instead of signing up for an internship with a master plumber. <clears throat> At the same time, becoming Jesus' disciple 
is of a different order than plumbing repair. The costs are incalculably higher. Most of us can probably recall someone who's helped us to become who we are today, a teacher or a pastor or a family member. The intensity of a life of discipleship demands will require a parallel intensity in the bond that we have with Jesus Christ. The idea that mission can simply be tacked on to church life or the Christian lifestyle as a secondary straight, sorry, a secondary trait does not line up with Jesus's words in this part of the Bible. To become an apostolic witness according to Christ is to experience the intensity of a relationship in which the teacher is, in a sense, reproduced in the student. Channeling Martin Luther's famous words, C.S. Lewis claimed just this when he said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Christ, to make them like little Christs. Nevertheless, Jesus expresses his own vocation as one um, not of peace, but a sword. Granting its metaphorical language also takes nothing away from its severity. Though Jesus may later tell Peter to put away an actual sword, here he takes one up symbolically to point out how his presence and his name will cause division even within the strongest of human organizational systems, the family unit. Such a sense of division and value system seems offensive to just about every religious tradition for which family matters. Not to mention the one which takes seriously the commandment to honor your mother and your father. But it should be noticed that Jesus does not offer a simple rejection of the family here. Obedience to Jesus will relativize household relationships rather than abolish them. So by following God's will, the definition of the family unit is redefined. Depending on one situation, it may mean that family loses its biological orientation altogether. When Jesus is pressed about his mother and brothers wanting to talk to him, he follows his own teaching by pointing to his disciples and saying, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, and sister and mother. God's will is the true basis on which human life ought to be organized. For those who might think that discipleship can represent part but not the whole of one's life, Jesus offers a harsh word. For those accepting this comprehensive calling, his words promise care and sustenance in the midst of a very costly sacrifice. Even the gospel's final words point to a new family paradigm. From here on out, disciples, we are told, will be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Forthright promises of division, rejection, and suffering are paired with equally strong statements claiming that every hair on our head is counted and that our lives, as fragile as they inevitably are, remain in God's hands. That language recalls the Sermon on the Mount. At the same time, the poles of loss and provision are inscribed in the final verse, those who, will, who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. In light of the master-disciple relationship, which Matthew has to this point emphasized to the reader, we cannot overlook what we see in verse 38. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. We should not be prepared to share in the exaltation of Jesus if we are not also prepared to share in his humiliation. Now, remarkably, this is the first time that Matthew mentions the word cross in his gospel. And it is not in direct reference to Jesus' crucifixion, but as a prerequisite to following Jesus. Matthew's message here is that unless we, in a sense, take up our cross, we cannot begin to comprehend the way of Jesus Christ, who took up, of course, the cross. 
The preparation of the apostles for Jesus' death and resurrection was not a matter of thinking the right thoughts or grasping it on a cognitive level. But by ordering of his gospel, Matthew seems to suggest that the only mission is the way of the cross. That's the only one that can prepare us for recognizing the Christ of the cross when he comes. And it may not be too much to claim that upon Jesus' return when he shows us his hands and his feet and he says that we will recognize him, but not simply because they show proof of his crucifixion. They should be familiar because they match our own wounds. Now, I will admit that I love that picture in my mind of our wounds themselves matching those of our Lord. I will admit that I feel wounded some of these days, and it is comforting to think that my suffering is tied directly to my God. And I've been thinking of that a lot in the last few weeks. What does it mean in 2023 to be a disciple of Christ? I will say that 2023 has had its fair share of anguish. The pandemic continues, troubled race relations and a toxic political culture have collided to make our current world extraordinarily hard to navigate. Tensions are high, people have limited bandwidth, we are tired and uncertain and anxious. And that is precisely why I think this scripture reading, in the end, is perfect for this morning. Because it's clear that Matthew is saying to all of us that we will be wounded and that we are meant to be wounded. Christians are not meant to roll over and just do what society tells them to do. We are meant to follow our Lord, to question, to defend, to push the world around us. And this is not easy work. Over and over again in the Bible, we are told that the life of a Christian is not meant to be easy. And this is a really hard message to hear. It is one that I guarantee will help you, though, tremendously over the course of your lifetime. The life of our Lord was devoted to service. Ours should be also. In the last few years, we have seen a massive shift in our national discourse. We've seen race relations take center stage. We've seen people struggle to communicate with one another. We've seen people who are overwhelmed with anger and frustration at the current system. We've seen peaceful protests and discussions as well as riots and screaming matches. These conversations we must now have as a country are difficult and fraught with overwhelming emotions on all sides. But that is where I believe that us Christians must step in. Because we understand suffering and we are called to do what we can to fix it. And although this is not always popular work, it is good work. It is uncomfortable, but it is worthy. It is difficult, but it is rewarding. It is also scary. But I'm here this morning to assure you that with God by your side, we are capable of anything. And this message, this particular part of of Matthew, resonates with me even more uh, this time of year as we approach both Mother's Day and Father's Day. I can remember when I was younger, my father seemed to me to be a man of biblical proportions. He was massive and loud with a confident, booming voice. And I would suspect many of us felt the same way about our own fathers. Growing up, our dads were powerful forces in our families, the ones who would make everything all right. So it's comforting to couch this morning's message in the familial structure that we all know and love. This morning's message comes directly from our Heavenly Father. And in his name, let us recommit ourselves to doing his work right here on earth. I will leave you this morning with the wise words from the psalm we read. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. 
Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like fire, a fire shut up in my bones. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. Sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Let us pray. Dear Lord, walk with us this week. Hold us in your embrace when we are tired and uncertain. Call us forward to create your kingdom right here on earth, even if we are wounded in the process. Make us your disciples, Lord, so that we might live in relationship with you. Amen. This is the time in the service when we're able to offer our gifts directly to God. Um, there is a misprint in the bulletin that I wanted to make sure people were aware of. The offertory anthem is actually just a closer walk with thee, and Keith Craner will be uh, on the trombone.
God invites us to hold the needs of others as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we present our continued good deeds and on behalf of the church and the world. Father, you call on us to love you and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation. Redeeming sustainer, visit your people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make you welcome not only in our concern for others, but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. Amen. Please join me in our closing hymn, which is number 372 in the red hymnal, How Firm a Foundation. now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance and grant you peace today and tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>